Greetings, I'm Berent, and welcome to Meet Me at the Table. Today we're going to be going through some of the differences between Madara when the 1.1 came out versus the 1.0. I was able to get a rule book during the Pledge Manager, so I do have an updated rule book. A lot of the things I'd like to cover are going to be more based on the cards than it's going to be in the rule book. There is a great video done by Succubus Publishing, link in the description below, that illustrates a lot of the main differences in this rule book. If you're interested in a more depth in look at that, please let me know in the comments below and I'll try to make a video for that as well. What we're mainly going to focus on is a lot of the differences in the cards. I did a poll asking what people would prefer if they'd like me to do one of these videos or not and I got kind of a 50-50 split. So I'm going to go through some of the changes here so that as you start playing Madara with your 1.0 and you had the one original one then you'll be able to know kind of what you're looking for when it comes to differences in some of the cards. Mainly in the players stuff and also in some of the monsters which is going to be really cool. There's a lot of interesting things that they've done to improve this game. There's been a lot of balancing that has been taking place over the course of the design period between this and the 1.0 coming out. A lot of it based on the community and also from Succubus Publishing themselves. Everybody was able to work together to create a massively fantastic game. I'm excited to show you these changes and if you're excited to see them then I need you to meet me at the table. We're going to start with the characters in the base game. We're first going to look at Rook. He actually got the biggest change, I think. Well, Remy got a really big change as well. Rook is actually going to go ahead and gain the ignore the first heavy instance found here on his card. The rest of him remains the same as he was in the 1.0 version. But it says right here, ignore the negative to movement from the instance of the first heavy weapon equipped. That's his main difference. All the rest is really the same. We'll move on to Zeke. Nothing on Zeke has changed. He is exactly the same. We're going to move into Nightingale. Again, Nightingale, nothing has changed. All of her abilities are the same. We're going to move into the next character, Remy. Remy has gained not only a new ability, but her flight has changed as well. Her new ability is Shady Training. You can exhaust her to move one space in any direction, including diagonal, which is absolutely awesome. She does not have that in the original version. Also, her avian flight has been slightly nerfed. She's able to still fly, but it says here the ability may only be used if Remy has less damage than half of her total HP. Those are the characters. A couple of them have changed, a couple of them remain the same. We're now going to move into our intelligent combatants. These are, have taken a lot of changes going through. The earlier you see the monster, I found the less changes there are, but the farther back in the game you go, the more changes you're going to see. We'll start with the cave sickles. What has changed here in the Cave Sickles really is this. Their Conviction die has changed from white and purple as opposed to two purple dice. One thing I do want to mention as I'm going through these changes is if you see a change that I have missed, please let me know in the comments below and I'll make sure to pin it to the actual video so that people may also know of those changes as well. But I did a pretty good job, I think, of scouring these cards the best I can. But you know, there is a chance I may have missed something, so please let me know. The Cave Sickles, of course, are still built in two different cards. We're going to remove both of those and move into the next card. We have our Geovaden. Again, may have pronounced that completely wrong. The change to Geovaden happens in a couple places up in his passive powers. First off, his adrenaline has changed. Right here it says each time the Geovaden is attacked, with the Geovaden will counter with a melee attack of up to reach 2. This is changed to the first time each turn the Geovaden can, it will counter with an attack of reach 2. It doesn't happen all the time now as it's moving through you. Ferocious has also changed. It says at the start, of the turn he gains courage it no longer says that now whenever he successfully dodges an attack he will gain courage so he's not always going to have that evil evil courage token and for those that don't know what a courage token is this courage token is right here when making an attack gain star shield and book discard if you miss that is what a courage token does it's absolutely terrible i'm not a big fan since that change has happened they have changed his ability his star abilities down or dice abilities down here as well he now actually gains some of the damage from all those different abilities because he might not always have that courage like he used to and he loses the plus two armor piercing Another change is in his first AI step. The difference in this now is that it says here, then move to be up to reach two from the farthest opponent. During this action, add plus four movement. There is not a plus four movement in this. So they have added the ability to give him plus four movement to get up to range. His casting, or sorry, his conviction dice has changed to two white from a white and a teal. And he has also lost one of his defense 
good. It makes him easier to hit. He was such a tough person to hit. So that's our Giovanni. We're going to move into our Water Loa. The Water Loa's passive has changed quite a bit, mainly because they've actually given it a tag. The Water Loa has Arcane and Elusive. Instead of having to explain what all that is up here, what Arcane does, when making an attack against the figure, all the symbols, the shield, the book, and the star rolled during the attack are considered non-existent. That is the Arcane tag. The Elusive tag that she has gained states that when making a voluntary movement, a figure with Elusive will never provoke break attacks from opponents who are adjacent to them at the start of the turn. If the figure with Elusive is push, pulled, or otherwise moved by an opponent ability, they will still provoke break attacks from adjacent figures. So she has gained the Elusive figure, and a lot of that is going to be spelled out in this area as well. So her passive has changed quite a bit based on the fact there are now tags. The Water Low is not affected by Water Terrain and may never choose to leave it. But it has lost the ability that says if it has, if it's out of the water, it will do everything in its power to move back towards water. That is gone off the new card. That you'll no longer see there. The line in number two has changed a little bit just so it's a little bit more clear. Basically, the difference is now we know where the water tokens are placed when the, the when he, we get to the then here. It says place water tokens on all adjacent spaces to the water law. Before, it just said place water tokens on all adjacent spaces. And people were a little confused that that had to do with the person being attacked or was it the water law herself? This now has cleared it up. The last AI is determined by the lowest total armor now instead of the lowest armor. So it's basically going to say here, uh, against the person with the lowest armor value, now it's the total armor value. So you're going to add up all your armor and decide what happens. It's just a little bit of a clarification. The dice remain the same. She does change these. Now instead, it does still get plus one to the attack roll instead of plus one to the roll. They've cleared up that a little bit. And it has a follow-up heal too, instead of the star just automatically healing her too. So if she misses with the attack, the follow-ups of course do not happen. That is how the game is played. These numbers have stayed the same, and her combat dice re also remain the same as well. We'll move on now to our animate. Ooh, the big giant creatures of iron, iron goodness. Being a beastly creature, he really has not changed much except for some of the dice down here. He has changed to a teal and orange for conviction instead of a white and orange. His casting die has improved to a teal instead of a white. And he has gained a point of armor from what he used to have in the past, oh, making him even tougher to get through. Moving to our Earth Loa. Well, we actually have two animate cards. We don't have two animate cards anymore. We have Earth Loas here. We have Imposing and the Earth Loa gains Hulking. Yes, that is where his passive has remained the same. What has changed on him is he gains a star symbol physical damage one down here. He doesn't have it over here. So they must have thought this creature was pretty good the way it was because nothing has really changed. In, when I'm going through these, of course, there also might be like an instance where they might have thrown in one word or they've maybe highlighted or dark or made one bold. I'm not talking about those as changes. I'm just kind of keeping with just the actual rule changes that may have come into play. So anything that's changed like to just make a word different or to highlight a word, I'm not really counting those as changes. This <laughs> Fragor has gone through a massive change. He's got a lot of things going for him differently because a lot of his bulb stuff that he had on his card is now on his tokens that you're going to be placing down. They have created an entire section on combatant tokens in the rule book that are going to explain burrow, bulb, puppet, root, and tentacle, which are going to be found on some of our intelligent combatants. This is a huge change that helps so much. They're no longer going to have a lot of stuff written on the cards. You're going to be referencing your combatant tokens when it comes to how you're going to control these when they're on the board. Some of the differences you're going to notice, other than that big one towards the bulbs that he has, is that he does actually talk about how he replaced part of the power where he doesn't provoke break attacks from his own bulbs right up here. His Cross of Hulk Husk is completely gone. He does have that anti-magic hum. Opponents, uh, while Fregor is alive, any opponents from the Sphere of Influence have a, of a bulb may not cast spells. That's also a thing that is in his passive, because his passive has completely changed. Also because of the changes to the bulb, his entire AI steps have pretty much changed. 
He has, is there an opponent adjacent? Make an attack against the opponent and with the most damage, follow up, inflict disease, force 11, continue down. So he has so many continue down here. A lot of these have changed. Like, can is there an opponent adjacent? Can it move to be adjacent to opponent? That's very similar, but it has changed quite a bit in where it is in the, in the form of his AI steps here. Is there an opponent within range six? Make a ranged six attack against the farthest opponent in range, then place a random bulb token on or adjacent to the target so that it is adjacent to as many opponents as possible but not on another bulb token and again we're continuing down so this thing continues to keep on going can it move adjacent to an opponent move to be adjacent to as many opponents as possible and deal a purple physical damage to the fragor and all adjacent figures so he is slightly hitting himself but that's okay <laughs> all these things of course are continuing down so except for this one if you cannot do that one you are going to move towards the nearest opponent he does a lot of things in his turn and he's a pretty deadly opponent uh, he has not changed down here with his physical damage of symbols. His casting die remains the same. He has doubled in health, which is something. And his combat dice are now two teal instead of a teal and an orange. A lot's changed on Fragor. We're going to move to the Blighted Guardian. First, we're going to start with his Miasma. It has slightly changed. First off, it is Force 12 now instead of Force 13. Also, the activation for this has changed. It says that the target of a spell or an attack, if it misses, uh, then it's going to end its current action for all ability and all abilities, and then it's going to inflict disease on an adjacent opponent. Before it was any time the Blighted Guardians dealt damage, it's going to inflict disease. So it's only if this fails, and if it fails, the action and abilities all fail, or else all stop, and then he has to do this Force 12 disease thing. So that Miasma has had a slight change. His first AI step here has also changed. It's still going to make the attack against the opponent with the most damage, but it's going to have a follow-up inflict poison force 12 instead of force 13, and it's going to add, then it's going to move up to range 4 from the nearest opponent, dodging any break attacks that this provokes. So he gains an extra little set of movement here after that. The is there an opponent within Sphere of Influence has slightly changed. We have added deal, uh, they are immune to paralyze, deal four magic damage instead. So if you, basically the way this works, paralyze has changed, I should mention that, that's a huge change. What paralyze does now is it only is going to affect you once in encounter, and after that happens, you're going to be gaining one of these immune to paralyze tokens that you're going to place on your character or on the enemies themselves. So they can only be affected once. So they've added a deal where you're going to gain, you're going to take four magic damage instead if you can't take the paralyze because you are immune to it. In the third line, with the change to paralyze, it has removed the can it move and attack a paralyzed opponent. It has just turned to can it move and attack an opponent. And it's removed the paralyzed on all of this right here. Also, it has gone from a force 12 to a force 13 when it comes to inflicting the poison. Other than that, nothing has changed in that. We're going to move on to the next AI step. It has changed from the nearest opponent to an opponent within four range, moved to be up to range four of two opponents instead of just up to the nearest opponent. So now it's up, he could be going up to two opponents, and they've added a lot of different steps here. With the addition of the second opponent, it's also gained an extra then make an attack four against a different opponent, follow up pull four, force 11, which it does over here, but now it's added an extra one so it can actually attack this other person that it's adjacent to. The dice, or it has added a follow up inflict wilt force 12 instead of follow up inflict disease. Its conviction dice have changed to a blue, or teal, sorry, and a green as opposed to a teal and orange, and its casting die is now a red instead of a green. These dice have remained the same. It has gained 10 hit points. You're going to see as we go forward with these more advanced uh, intelligent combatants that they've really buffed the hit points on these characters. The Blighted Guardian. Moving on to the Murkhound. In his aquatic section up here, he has removed the statement that it movement it makes must be towards water or muck if it is out of water. It has removed that from the aquatic tag that he has. Sticky removed the does not apply to opponents on different elevations, so we don't have that in here anymore. It says does not apply to opponents that are on different elevations. They have removed that from the sticky step. 
and the Merck Bound, that has remained the same. Submerged, though, has changed slightly. It used to be while in water or muck, the Merc Hound can only be targeted by adjacent opponents. Now it says that while the Merc Hound is in water or muck only, adventurers who are adjacent to the Merc Hound may draw a line of sight or sphere of influence to it. It allows us to now use our sphere of influence attacks as long as we are adjacent to it. Before it was just line of sight for, so basically an only melee attack. It. So they've changed that a little bit, and being, we get a little bit more we can do to this guy. They've adjusted the AI steps. They have removed the can it make an attack opponent adjacent to another Merc Hound and added, is there an opponent within range eight? So they've add, removed this step, added this step, but the other two they have left in there. The symbols that he has down here have changed. He still gains the physical damage, but it's with shields instead of books. His star power inflicts poison, paralyzed, sorry, with a force 12, and he has lost the plus four armor piercing. His Conviction Dice has gone from a Teal and an Orange from two Teal Dice. He has gained four health, and he's now attacking with a Green and Red Die instead of two Red Dice. Moving on to our next combatant, we have a Living obl Ablation. This has gone through some changes as well. Firstly, her Dark Majesty is instead of Hemlock and Seer. She has gained the Nimble ability, which is one of the changes. Line 4 of her AI has changed quite a bit, basically changing a lot of the dice here. The AI change on line 4 changed the priority first to the highest total armor. The dice roll changed from 5 purple to 2 purple, 2 orange, and 2 red dice. The deal 1 magic damage has still changed, but it gains a then ability, which I can cast the spell again, prioritizing the opponent with the lowest total armor value. So it's pretty bad. There's been a slight change in the wording for the Encounter Esper alive on the board. It's take a turn with the listed Encounter Esper instead of activate the listed Esper. This may, change has come, across, come about because the summoning rules have changed a little bit as well. Please go check out their video to find out a little bit more about that. The next one, of course, is the Encounter Esper not on the board. They have changed it basically to help fit the new spawning rules. Spawn the listed Encounter Esper as an opposing Esper and place it within Sphere of Influence to the, as, the close, as close to the opponent as possible, which has just changed from spawn the listed Esper and place it within Sphere of Influence as possible person. Again, since the new change to summon, they just wanted to make sure that this character is summoning these to the board. The Conviction dice have stayed the same, but the casting has changed to a green instead of a gray. She does keep the red dice. She has gained 10 hit points and lost one armor. So at least she's not soaking up as much damage, but she's going to have to take more to get through it. We'll move on to our gatekeeper. We'll start with the passive keys on keys. It remains protection resistance against range attacks, but if it ever drops to 20 or gains 20 or more damage, it's going to get three plus three armor, bringing the armor value to five, which is just ridiculous. The passive power has changed from Strange Creations from Puppet, and again, Puppet is one of those tokens, so you're going to find a lot of this text is going to be found in that section where those tokens are. It does say here at the start of the Gatekeeper's turn, all puppets move up to two spaces towards the nearest opponent. That has remained the same, which is right here at the bottom, All, but all the rest of this text is going to be described and clarified inside that section on tokens. A change to the AI steps is, is there an opponent that shares a space with the puppet? They have ignoring sphere of influence as one of the changes here. Other than that, the power has remained pretty much the same. They have changed in the bottom section here the move to as many opponents as possible. Uh, it's going to prioritize uh, the opponent who is adjacent to the most opponents as opposed to the opponent who is adjacent to the most figures. They have changed that word. And why is that an important word, even though I said I wasn't going to talk about little words? They have changed some of these words from figures, opponents, and allies so that it won't target certain things when it's actually making the attack. The dice have changed. We have a green, double green instead of a green and gray. Cassie has changed to a green from a gray, gaining 15 hit points or health points here. And don't forget that extra armor if it actually takes a ton of damage. Other than that, it hasn't changed its combat dice. We're going to move into our Tortured Immortal. Starting at his passive power, he has gained the Torching Immortal has provoked two, which is a new tag. This tag is pretty much talking about the same thing here in his actual a lifetime in the dark. What provoke is going to do is based on the number here is how far his break attacks can actually go. So provoke two gives him a range of two on his break attacks. 
the actual wording itself is any figure that leaves a space within range X of a figure with provoke will provoke a break attack from that space. So giving him this tag kind of clears up some of the writing on that first pass or from the passive power up here. Also in the passive power, it has changed to each time the Tortured Immortal is attacked, it will counter. To the first time each turn the Tortured Immortal can, it will counter with a melee attack at up to reach 2. So it's not going to be doing this constantly, it's only going to be doing it the first time. His first AI step, the only major change here is it's now a Strength 12 check instead of an Agility 12 check. Again, in Line 3, we have changed it to a Strength check as opposed to an Agility check. And it has gained a star symbol physical damage too as opposed to the books. His dice have all changed. They're teal and green and gray as opposed to straight reds. He's gained 15 health points and an armor point as well. His combat dice remain the same. Huh, tortured immortals. Cool, cool. Corpse Collector. His passive has completely changed, again based on the fact that these tentacles are going to be found in the token section. He has kept the hulking, and when an adventurer attempts to make a range attack or spell against a corpse collector, they must reduce their total range or sphere of influence by half. That is all you're getting from partly submerged. This entire passive on this corpse collector is gone, and that has been replaced by that partially submerged. Each tentacle now will move separately and be rolling a purple die as opposed to just moving two spaces towards the nearest opponent. This second AI step is completely new. It is not on the original card. Make a separate melee attack against each opponent within reach four and continue down. So it adds that step. The third AI step, the magic damage is now eight instead of 18, which is a big change. And the dice changed from green to red as opposed to two blue. This has changed to a green from a gray. It's gained these extra dice symbols here, plus one physical damage and a star follow-up, pull four, force 12. It's gained 20 health, but it's a little bit easier to hit, losing two defense, but it has gained one extra armor, and its combat dice have changed from two gray to two green. Moving into our last few intelligent combatants, we have the Soul Butcher. His Puget Presence changed to affect spells as well. It's a huge block of text here, but really the only thing that has changed is it does say that instead of opponents just attacking, it will say here that if they do not, if the attack or spell fails, the effect of the Soul Butcher and the current action and ability, then the Soul Butcher moves toward the opponent. If the Soul Butcher is adjacent to the opponent, it will make a melee attack against them. Uh, then, of course, it's going to continue on. In the <laughs> then the opponent ends their turn adjacent to the Soul Butcher. They're dealt to magic damage. That is still the same. It does lose that if the opponent is adjacent, deal 4 magic damage instead of force 14. It loses that. It just deals the 2 magic damage if you end their turn adjacent. It does remove the sphere of influence they are dealt 2 magic damage. So there, a lot has changed inside his putrid presence. Just please take a look at that one. Uh, he does remain relentless and hulking. The force of the first AI step has gone from 14 to 13 when it comes to what you have to pass for it. The fourth AI step, last, the last part of it is Sphere of Influence Darkness instead of Single Target Paralyze. It's right here. Sphere of Influence Darkness, Inflict Paralyze on the same, against the same target. That has changed a little bit. Also, his symbols down here have slightly changed. He keeps his plus two physical damage for his shield, but he gains two books, follow up heal five, that instead of the star heal five. Instead, the star is turned into a follow up inflict poison at force 11. His conviction dice have gone to a green and a gray, and as opposed to two green, he gains 20 hit points. And other than that, the rest of his stat block remains the same, along with his combat dice. We're going to move into our, I think it's our final, no, we have two more, two more. We have the Grotesque Effigy, and we have the Lich Worm. So our Grotesque Effigy, again, is going to be using roots. These roots are tokens. These tokens are going to be found in that section in the rule book. So a lot of his passive is going to have changed. The first off that colony, it's going to lose all the info on the roots, but the regrowth has changed as well. We're going to gain... Crush, Unstoppable, Hulking, Colossal, and he's immune to Condemn. Before, he was just immune to Condemn, Darkness, Paralyze, and Poison. So you can do more status effects to him. Of course, Condemn is still there that he is going to remain immune to. He has the ability to gain heal tokens. It used to be a maximum of four. Now the maximum of was going to only be two. 
Down in his AI steps, they've changed the amount that you're pulled by when it comes to this pull effect from six to the blue die. So it is a little bit more random. The bottom ability here, you're going to lose the things about the black die. Also, it is now a reach two instead of adjacent opponent. The black die was pretty bad. It used to be if you rolled a shield, you'd get, you rolled, you would add 12 physical damage. Oof, duh, that's out of control. We do have a lot of changes down here. His convictions are both are go to a teal and a green instead of two red. He is gaining a empower die in his combat pool. His health, believe it or not, has stayed the same. And actually, all the rest of his stats are the same, which is pretty different from all the other bigger men, monsters we fight. We're going to move on to the last one of these actual intelligent combatants, and that is the Lich Worm. This is our final intelligent combatant that we're going to see a big change in based on the tokens. All the stuff that has to do with Barry is now on those tokens. So we're not going to have any text about Barry in here, except for the fact that it will just say, otherwise burrow down here, replace the Lich Worms figure with a burrowed token. So that's going to be different based because now we have those tokens that are going to explain a lot of what's going on. It gains Colossal and Hulking and an immunity to Condemned. Also, Crush appears when it is not burrowed, so it does gain some new things, and of course, with that immunity condemned, that's something else. Confusing Pheromones has gained a lot more text. What can, the Pheromones used to do before is that when you're within Sphere of Influence, you're not able to leave its Sphere of Influence during a move action. This has changed to give us the ability at least to <laughs> protect ourselves a little bit from it. They, now, if you're within Sphere of Influence, you have to do a Presence 12 check. If you fail this skill, the check then their current action and abilities immediately end. So there is a little bit of a change. Also, an opponent would ever make a move action or use a free movement with, with that would move them out of the Lich's worm sphere of influence. That's when you do the check. So I, at least you have ability to get out of it. The problem, of course, if you fail, you're, you pretty much end your turn, which is something else. There's some clearing up of some of the text that is inside this second AI thing, and it is now a Force 12 instead of a Force 14 when it comes to the push that is going to happen on the follow-up. His symbols have changed. Instead of doing one physical damage with a book, he now does it with a shield. He gets two books. He's able to do a follow-up heal one, and his star is two physical damage instead of three. He's got a teal and a green conviction die as opposed to two green. His stats, again, have stayed the same, and so has his combat dice, and that's the Lich Worm. The rest of these enemies here that are on the, in the, that come in the 1.1 pack are alternatives, and the way these work is if you look right down here, it'll say, spawning rules. The cave sickle spawned are elder cave sickles and use the elder cave sickles intelligent combatant cards instead under the following conditions. If the current loot level is common or any time during a bounty of two. And then there's even one farther than these elders and that's the ancient. And these are going to be used when you use loot level. Was it uncommon? Uh, uncommon or the three when it comes to any bounty side quests. These are really cool. I'm really glad they included them. They make the monsters become harder as you become better. Instead of adding, instead of just fighting more and more of the same stuff, all these different monsters are harder versions of the one before. So we've got Geovadans, we've got Animates, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in here. Earth Loas, it's really kind of neat how they did this. So those are all the different combatants, the intelligent combatants. Moving into the medium cards, the only thing that has changed the mundane consumables is that this card now has an alcohol key tag here. Other than that, not a single thing has changed in the mundane consumables, not the number of them or any wording changes at all. We're going to move into the weapon differences. Before we do that, there is something I want to talk about. A lot of people ask me what card sleeves I use. I sleeve all my cards, and as you can see by the glare when I pull it up, that they're actually tight fit to this thing all the way to the top. I'm a big fan of having it like that. So actually the ones I use is this brand right here. This is the Mayday Games, was it US standard size card sleeves, 57.5 millimeters by 89 millimeters. I am not by any chance affiliated or getting paid by Mayday at all, but I wanted you to know which ones I use. So even if you use any other card sleeves company, this is the size you're looking for, 57.5 by 89 to really fit those cards perfectly. The smaller cards, the ones I use are these two. These are the two I use. The, I use the 41 by 63 millimeter ones. The 100 packs I use for the disciplines because I don't 
shuffle them. Anything I shuffle, I try to use this more thicker brand, which is this one right here, the 125% thicker one. It only comes in 50 of them, but I'll use these for such like the initiative uh, track or the combatant loot cards, things I shuffle. I use that one. Let's continue on now and see the differences between all of these weapons. We have our long sword. This is the one that you're using as a double sword. The only difference here is that you're going to gain the combo long sword. Your attacks gain plus two physical damage, and we have the additional physical damage down here using a star. This is a two-handed weapon, or it can be used single or double. This is the double version where you're actually using two hands for it. And the passive has added the item may not have more than one upgrade. This is because people were unsure of and were able to take advantage of the fact that this thing could have two upgrades on the single side, flip it and keep the two doubles to keep the two different uh, upgrades when it came, or actually, sorry, put the two upgrades on the double side, flip it, and they'd still have the two upgrades when you're using it single-handed and be able to attach another item to it that has another upgrade. So you'd be able to get three upgrades and that's no longer the case. We have two long swords. Next, we have this. It's a Spellcraft Blunt Tome. This is the Magic Tome. Uh, let's see the differences in this one. The differences now is that this is allowed to be used as a ranged or melee attack weapon. Uh, there also, it loses its passive white upgrade. And in the text of the flip, it signifies what spells can be cast. It tells you that if it has a per encounter flip or flip condition, that those spells can't be cast. Basically, what the tome does is I can flip this after resolving a spell I cast, so long as the spell didn't have a per encounter flip condition to cast that spell again. So you could, for example, cast Gore Shot twice with this weapon because it doesn't have a flip condition. But it, or a per encounter condition. It has just an exhausted condition. It also gains a plus one magic damage when we go to attack with it. This is a, uh, also when you flip it, it's going to gain this ability on the other side. Again, it loses its casting upgrade white, and the rest of it remains the same with the plus one magic damage. We have two of those magic tomes. Then we have our short sword. I believe our short sword has stayed the same. There's absolutely no change on this card. We again have two of those. Those are Zeke's pride and joy at the beginning of the game. Next, we have our hand axe. What it has here is it does add a once per attack condition. I'm sorry, per encounter condition, not axe condition, per attack condition. Basically what it does, it gains the ability to throw this thing. <laughs> you can throw it and do a purple damage die. That's the only difference with the hand axe. Moving into the buckler, the buckler doesn't have any change as well. It is exactly as it is. The shields remain basically the same. The medium shield is also exactly the same. Nothing has changed on the medium shield. Our Warhammers have changed slightly. This was a starter weapon for Rook when he actually played the thing. When he started, they gained the uh, combo shield. These things can now combo with shields. Also, it the gains plus one armor and heavy. The ability does not stack with another Warhammer. That has changed from this side over here. Basically, Rook was super slow when you started with this thing, so they kind of allowed him to be able to move a little bit more with this, and he's able to do a little bit more damage. The physical damage down here has changed. It gets two plus two with two of these instead of one. So his damage output has gone up with these Warhammers as well. Now, of course, that's just at the beginning during the mast. After that, you're able to equip your characters with whatever you want, which is pretty cool. Next, we have our Morning Star. Our Morning Star gains the passive uh, with the following uh, statement that says actions and abilities. Uh, when you defeat an opponent, you may end the current action or end all abilities, then move up to two spaces. That has So it has this new passive power down here. It does lose its follow-up ability down here. The target of your attack was defeated, moved two spaces. Instead, they've just given it the passive. They've cha changed it from actually having to roll a uh, symbol on the die to just being able to do it. The guitar is next. The guitar has absolutely no change to it. We're going to move on to the next weapon, which is the Thieves' Dagger. The Thieves' Dagger uh, gains a, where is it? It gains, it loses the exhaust dodge ability. It no longer is able to dodge when you use the Thieves' Dagger, but everything else does remain the same. We're going to move on to the next one. We have our one-shot War Axe. Oh, this weapon was awesome. Now, the funny thing is it actually has gotten less. It's less cost. It costs less to actually own this thing. Also down on the bottom, it has a, it's changed a little bit of the text here to basically talk about how it is this weapon. When determining damage of an attack with attack, this weapon gains plus one physical damage. So it's making sure that other things aren't activating off this book symbol here to gain the damage. That's the only difference with the war axe. We do have our great hammer. Our great hammer has absolutely no change to it. Nothing has changed at all. We're moving into the halberd. 
the halberd has gained the tag provoke two instead of all this text that has to do with being able to provoke break attacks of reach two because that's what provoke does now that it's a new tag. That's it for the halberd. Let's move on to the hand crossbow. These have made, had a pretty big change to them. They lose the combo tag here instead of shield and archery and just gain a giant passive power. The passive power is when countering, you may choose any target within range of your equipped weapon. That has remained the same. The finesse white is still the same, but it has two. It says here if your if paired weapon doesn't have finesse white, this gains finesse white. So these together don't get the air, the whites. Um, basically, what's going to happen here is if these are, are paired together, there is no comboing anymore. This would gain a white finesse but this one would not because this one would already have that finesse white i hope that makes sense it does gain plus one armor piercing but it does lose the or sorry it doesn't gain it it keeps the plus one armor piercing it loses the dodge exhaust power here so a little bit has changed with the can crossbow and the other notable change that you may not notice is the fact that the art is completely reversed <laughs> which is kind of cool i think that's pretty neat also there's an interesting thing here i want to show i don't know if i'm going to be able to show it well on camera but if you are looking at the 1.0 versus the 1.1 the black text down here is actually a little bit higher up than the other one not very much and it's very hard to notice and i don't really know if it works for everything but some of them has a little bit the black part of the text is actually a little bit higher up on it but anyway we're going to move on to the crossbow with the change to arrows the crossbow had to change as well it is now an exhaust and arrow you have equipped to unexhaust this card instead of flipping an arrow because arrows no longer flip they just they're, they're relics and you'll see that when we get to the relic section other than that the crossbow has not changed we do have our longbow next our longbow is actually 5 GP more now. It actually costs more to have this crossbow, and it clears up some of the uh, uh, ambiguity of the text on these rules here in the passive power. But otherwise, everything remains the same on the crossbow. Our magic talisman has changed a little bit. It loses the conviction, up, or the sorry, the upgrade for casting to white. Apparently, magic was super powerful, and so <laughs> we have they've taken away the white upgrade on all the mundane weapons, which is really too bad. I was a huge fan of the way Gore Shower <laughs> It works so good. It also is going to go ahead and add the, was there's, what it does is it also adds this for a melee and ranged attack. You're able to use, this is part of the attacking now, instead of if you were to, you had this with like a hand crossbow, you wouldn't be able to use the extra dice or the abilities on this card. You wouldn't be able to use the empower. That's basically the only change. Oh, there is one more. We get the star magic damage, and there are two magic talisman. And the last one we have is our magic staff. It has gone through a lot of change as well. The first thing is it costs five GPs less. Its dice have changed from two purple to a white and a purple, so it is a little bit better when you go to attack with it. The only thing that's interesting about this is it does gain keep its casting upgrade white. It is the only mutinane weapon that has a casting upgrade now, which is pretty cool. Also, this is going to add energy tokens. When determining the force of a spell, you may discard any amount of energy tokens. There are a lot of different items and abilities that use these tokens. They didn't really have a token. They would just say add a certain type of token or just add a token. They weren't really clear on what tokens you added. And for the most part, it really didn't matter. It's just so that you'd have an idea of what actually the tokens that you had tokens on the card. Now they've created these energy tokens. They look like these. They have these energy tokens on the back. These are what you're going to be using to when you go ahead and use this and any of the other powers or items that use tokens energy tokens are going to be used these are what you're going to use this exhaust power has changed a little bit we're adding a white die of magic damage instead of rolling the black die and the target is dealt one magic damage per book now it's a actual white die of magic so this thing has gotten a bigger boost this might be a weapon i might want to try out because there's a huge boost to this and it looks like it might be really cool to have when you're actually creating like a magic type class of course this is a two-handed weapon so actually hitting things with it isn't probably going to be your best bet but if you do, there is a added magic damage down here with the star magic damage. So it does get a little bit of boost when it comes to actually fighting with it. Those are all the weapon cards. Let's move on to the next. Moving into our cores, really the only one that's changed is the utility core. The utility core has changed its passive. There's no flipping anymore, and it's cleared up some 
uh, rules where you have to have this while you're actually doing the adventure. You can't put this in a backpack and bring it back out. It says right here, the end of each encounter, if you had the core equipped since the beginning of the encounter. So one of the tricks was to be able to put this in your backpack, pull it out right in when you needed to actually use its ability to gain a single consumable item of your choice of this level, loot, or lower. That no longer says you can't actually do that. Other than that, the, only, the other two cores have remained exactly the same. The ability core is the same, and also our defensive core is the same, and our deflection core has remained the same as well. Moving into the armor, we're going to see some bigger changes here. The occult shirt has gone through a massive change. This thing was pretty much broken at one point. You're going to gain three extra health when you're wearing it now, which is pretty good. It bumps people's hit points up, so there's not a lot of one-shots at the beginning of the game. Sadly, it happened to one person I know where you actually got <laughs> he met a couple uh, cave sickles, and it was the end of him in one turn. With this, he would have actually probably survived. They've changed this now where this no longer is an exhaust dodge, in, and then allowing you to unexhaust this card and counter. They've gotten rid of the unexhausting. You could just keep using this thing. It was out of control. Instead, it just is going to dodge, and if you're successful, you are able to counter. It gives a passive on that dodge, giving it a little bit of ability to gain defense. The only way you're going to not gain defense is with a skull. So even if you roll the quad books, you're still going to gain some defense towards this. That's the occult shirts. Both of them are the same, even though the art is a little bit different. We'll move into the BA leather jacket. The only difference here is that I actually gain an armor for this now and two extra health points when wearing this jacket. The rest has remained the same. The next item that we have is the cuirass. This has also seen some change. It gains an extra armor and two health. Also, the exhaust here is no longer an exhausting ability. It is now a per encounter ability. And it says when you are dealt damage from an attack, ignore all physical damage dealt to you instead of reducing it by two over a many different times. You can just flat out ignore one complete hit. Those are the armors. Let's move into the next cards. Move into the mundane relics. Next, we're going to start with the Wand of Missiles. The first thing we're going to notice is a drop in cost. It is seven less. Other than that, this backside has remained the same. If we flip it over, though, it is able to be used as a weapon as well. Again, the cost remains negative seven. That would be real weird if it didn't. And it gains the range of four instead of a melee attack. Also, it loses its combo wand for casting upgrade white. It still keeps the, com the combo wand for this. It's an exhaust ability that remains the same, but it's found inside the combo ability now. We have a plus one magic damage when it comes to the star. Moving into our next one, we have our fate engine. Nothing has changed with the fate engine. It has remained the same. Next, we have the fight drive. Again, nothing has changed with the fight drive. It is still the same. We have the enchanted piercings which has replaced the flip condition to a once per encounter condition. They no longer flip. That's the end of the enchanting piercings. Now here's a big change. We no longer see the quiver in our, in our set when it comes to the relics, and we have gained true flight arrows. Succubus Publishing has removed arrows from the consumables altogether, and you're going to find them in the relic section now. Also, they don't have a flip condition anymore. They're just exhaust before you make an attack. To, the target of this attack cannot dodge. So it gives archers a little bit more freedom of not even of when to choose and use arrows, and they don't take up consumable slots anymore, so you can put potions and stuff in there as well. It does have a combo archery. When you make an attack, gain plus one to the range. You are limited to having one arrow item equipped. So again, different from before. Before, you couldn't have three consumable arrows and just decide which one you want to use. You have to choose the arrow you want. Now, of course, you can do a re-equip action, which you could then change out these arrows from your backpack if you wish to. But just be aware that this is now moved to the relic section, and they've removed the quiver from the relic section altogether. That's the relics. Let's move into something else. Accessories have gained a massive change as well. Instead of them all having a rarity level now, instead of mundane, common, uncommon, and rare, all the accessories are available and they all cost 30, but they all have a passive power that says increase the cost of this item by 30 gold for every loot level beyond mundane. So if you buy them during the mundane, it's going to be 30, but of course as you gain loot levels, these are going to increase in price as well. Some of them have changed as well. This one has not. It has remained the same. Once per encounter, when you're defeated by an opponent, heal one and remains in, and remain in place. So this has changed. Of course, the gold value on a lot of these have completely changed. I might not mention that every time. Just be, be aware that every gold value has changed. Next, we have our Ethereum coat here, here that uh, is just going to give us some added health instead of the armor and two health. It does, of course, have that passive, and it gains the per encounter at any time. Reroll re -roll any die except black 
for you and or an ally within sphere of influence that is the only change to this again we have a dollar value difference we have gained the passive and that is it for this one nothing else have changed we'll move on to the next one we have weapon straps these again have the exact I'm, i think i'll stop talking about the gold change and the passives just to be aware that all of them have that other things that have changed on this is increase uh, the combo melee has just got an exhaust dodge. It doesn't gain the extra bonus of if it had rolls anything but a skull, it gains these. That doesn't have any more. Also, the exhaust make a re-equip action has been changed to the passive power. The first re-equip action you make each turn is free, so you can only do it once per action instead of being able to exhaust. If there's a way to unexhaust this, you could exhaust it again, unexhaust it, exhaust it again. They're trying to prevent some of these cards from being abused in any way. So those are the weapon straps. We'll move into our swashbuckler's garb. A lot has changed on this card. It gains the exhaust counter ability, and its passive used to be you may equip item upgrades to this accessory. Upgrades have also made a huge change. So instead what they're gonna do is give you the ability to increase the, uh, to, sorry, uh, con conviction upgrade X, where X is equal to one of your equipped combat dice. So this will be able to grow in power, and accessories have a tendency to do that. They'll grow in power, or you're going to be at least viable throughout the entire campaign for you. They don't ever really lose their their power, I guess you could say, because their powers are usually pretty universal that are going to help almost all the time. Next, we have our adventurer's backpack. It changed how much you could put in there. Instead of a, a, uh, three consumables, you are going to be able to put in six items. It says increase your pack size to six. Also, the exhaust has allowed you to do it at any time instead of make a re-equip action. So at any time, you can do the re-equip action. Normally, the re-equip action, of course, is only done on your turn. This allows you to do it at any time, which is pretty good. We have too many belts. What's changed here is in the passive power. It says if you dodge and the attack deals damage, reduce physical damage dealt to you by two. It's not the first time each turn you are dealt physical damage. It no longer is that. You have to actually dodge in order to make this thing trigger. So that's too many belts. And we have the cloak. The cloak gives us the tag protection from now on instead of, and it loses its passive when making a conviction check at books add plus one to your roll. And protection is a new tag. It states, when casting a spell against a figure with protection, that figure adds black die to their conviction dice. When making a conviction check, all books rolled this way, add plus one to their conviction roll. So it seems very similar to the passive power that we actually have down here, but do be aware that it only affects when casting a spell against the figure. So it's not all conviction checks anymore. That's our cloak. And then we have our quiver back. Our quiver has now is now found in the accessories since we have the arrows in the relic section. And everything on here is different from what the original one was. So just go ahead and read your quiver card, and anything on here is brand new. There's n The change to the quiver is completely 100% different. That's our accessories. We'll be moving into the next set of cards, which are going to be our mundane unique weapons. These are technically not available in any of the stores. So right here, I'm gonna be putting a big spoiler tag. You're gonna see it right there on the screen. If you do not wanna see these, or the monster relics or items that you're able to gain from the monsters. The ones I'm gonna do are going to be from the Cave Sickle all the way up through the Geovaden and Animate, which are the monsters you're gonna see throughout the mast. I'm gonna go through those monster items and also our unique items as well, weapons I mean, or items and weapons. That's why you're seeing another huge big spoiler tag right here. If you don't wanna see this, timestamps in this video so you can go to the next section which we're going to talk about the smaller cards next. Moving into these unique mundane weapons, we have our Wand of Hindsight. The only difference here is our wand has no longer giving us an orange, it is giving us a white die. It also has a range of four instead of a melee attack, very similar to the other wand we saw earlier. Also, this casting die is a passive now. It is no longer an exhaust ability, or sorry, combo ability. And it does gain a combo wand ability now instead of just the exhaust ability over here. But the exhaust ability on this with comboing with a wand is pretty much the same. That's our wand of hindsight. Hindsight, we're going to move into the next core. We have our heart shaped box. Here we're going to see another area where they use the energy tokens. So this will start gaining energy tokens instead of, I believe it says health tokens. And those are the, that's the only change here on the heart-shaped box. We have our next one is our shield. I have to keep flipping these. I apologize. Bone shaker. Bone shaker, I don't think has seen any change. It is exactly the same as what it was before. Next we do have our sword, which is sword of dominions. 
which has also remained exactly the same. There is no change in here. Oh, the bow. We have this bow. I got to play with this bow once. This bow is awesome. Bear of Justice. There's a small wording change in here, somewhere in here that I believe has to do with the attack to the attack roll as opposed to just gaining plus one in here. Other than, and they've kind of bolded the physical damage, things like that. But again, nothing has really changed with this weapon. The uniques have really not seen too much of a change. We have our short sword, or sorry, it's not a short sword, just a sword saber, and it's called Esplance. The change on this one is that right in the passive power, it says that you're able to, if you do not have the heavy tag ignore hindering train of making an attack, this used to talk about ignoring the negative effects of movement from the train. So it just affects the attack now, not movement. And the last one we have is our sentient bodysuit. This one used to be able to not stack with other things. This effect cannot stack. It can now stack. So you can heal with multiple, I guess you have multiple, there's only one of them. But this is a mundane unique accessory. So when I said all accessories are available from the start, the unique ones are not and when you go to shop and train it'll tell you which items are available for purchase the very first time you go after the mass this will not be for purchase so just be aware of that moving into our monster loot cards there's only two i'm going to show you again to prevent a lot of spoilers all, all, all everything up to the geovaden and animate have and then the water loa and these cave sickles Nothing has changed except for these two cards. So I just want to talk about them and then we're going to move on. This one has changed. It's no longer per encounter. It is a passive effect that allows you to gain follow up inflict poison where it's equal to our highest level discipline. So it is able to inflict poison quite often instead of just once per encounter. The other one is the animate shard. The animate shard no longer is a discard during the shop and train phase. Instead of the passive and during the shop and train phase, I may choose to sell this item and gain 25 gold. Why is that change important? There's been a massive change to the way that the upgrade system is in Madara. And let's quickly take a look at that so you can know what the difference is and why this actually matters. The biggest difference comes from how basically they're unlocked. All monster loot cards have the material tag, and any card of this tag may be traded in during the shop to perform one of the three benefits. You're either able to gain that 25 gold, gain and equip any single item upgrade of your choice from the uh, to an item for free, or unlock a single upgrade of your choice. Before these used to be available, these uh, upgrades used to be available to you based on loot level, and you could buy them and put them on your weapons, and, and that was how it worked. But now what you're going to be doing is trying to gain some of that monster loot. And when you have the monster loot, you're able to either sell for 25 gold like this one, which is why it's now a passive power instead of an automatic. Or I can use the material tag on here to go ahead and use it to gain an upgrade of my choice to either immediately equip to an item of my choice or just have it unlocked for us in the future. I'm not going to go through every upgrade. I just want to demonstrate exactly what I'm talking about. So here are now the item upgrades. And as you can see, every one of them just says item upgrade now. They are no longer tied to either an Earth Loa or a Mundane or an Uncommon or a Earth Loa. They are no longer linked to a certain rarity type. The difference is now, of course, you're going to be also adding, depending on when and what item you're placing your upgrades on, is where you're going to find the cost chain cost of these. It could be like 15 for Mundane, 30 for... Uh, uncommon, I believe, and it just goes up from there. And they have all changed. They're no longer, they're all just are giving a little bit of bonuses based on, of course, the farther in you find this, the more powerful this upgrade is going to become. And so instead, they've decided to balance these across the board that you can use almost all the time now. So this now, like a lot of them are just going to give, uni these are all universal, these yellow ones. And you have multiples of certain ones. And once you run out of a certain item, or sorry, upgrade, you're going to have to either find a way to take it off the other, or you have to pay to take it off whatever it's on, the other one is on, and then place it on here. Because remember, when you first find one, I could find this up this thing right here, this animate shard, and I could go ahead and remove it to be able to add an upgrade of my choice to an item. So say I want to add a sentient one to my to my one of my items, and there aren't any more. I've ran out. Say these are all on other things. I would have to. I wouldn't be able to put one of these on there because there aren't any available. These are a finite resource. So you'd have to find a way to actually get this off of one of the other items you have. You could, I believe, sell the item with the upgrade on it, and you would make the money back from that item. Very, very little from where to what you pay for it. But you'd be able to then get this back into the pool, and then you could attach it again. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight as to how these upgrades have changed a little bit. 
and what you can expect going forward in Madara from upgrades. And that's all I'm going to say on upgrades. I'm not going to go through all the different upgrades. There's four different colors of upgrades. One does like weapons and spells. One does cores. One does armor. And these are the universal ones that can go on about anything you want. Moving into the smaller cards, we have the combatant loot deck and the initiative cards. Nothing's changed except for one thing. Our twins are now separate cards on the track for both uh, allies and enemies. That's the only change. We're going to move into the disciplines now. I'm only going to explain the level one changes. I'm not going to do two, three, and four. But as we play through the game, yes, I am coming back to Madara. I'll be explaining the two, threes, and fours as we get to those. The first thing we're going to talk about is the fact that Wretched Tether is no longer a level one courier discipline. It is now a level three discipline. Life Tithe is a new discipline that has come to this 1.1 version. It has an exhaust power that an opponent within Sphere of Influence is dealt magic damage equal to your highest level courier discipline. Sounds very good. We're going to go ahead and put that one to the side. Those are new and that one has changed. Next, we're going into the ones that ha are, you have seen before. We're going to start with Oxygen Siphon. That one has not changed. We'll move into Imbued Fear. Imbued Fear, main change is it is an exhaust ability now instead of paying two. Most of the rest of this is the same. There's just some changes to some of the wording that has been taking place. Uh, make a ranged or melee attack at plus two physical damage during this attack. This just says make an attack, so it's getting rid of the range and uh, melee symbol. It's just going to make an attack, and it still gains the plus two physical damage. It's just found down in this box with the rest of this stuff, and those all the stuff in the box then is pretty much the same. The imbued fear has not changed too much. We do have gore shot. This has seen a big change. This used to be my go-to kill anything shot, but it's no longer that way. Basically, the big difference is it used to be one stamina point. You could cast this multiple times. You could cast up to three times in a turn. It was absolutely out of control. Now it has totally changed. It is just an exhaust. You're only able to do it when you exhaust the card. The what other thing has changed is now and you are able to deal magic damage equal to two times your highest career level instead of one irreducible damage equal to the additional magic damage equal to your career discipline. But you are still uh, dealt uh, one irreducible damage. Instead, sorry, instead of one irreducible damage, you're taking two to make this happen, and you're not doing damage equal to highest level discipline. You're doing two times your highest level discipline. So it has gained a buff and a nerf all at the same time. That's our fantastic lovable gore shot. To Faust is our next one. To Faust has changed the amount of damage you need to gain a Vow token from three to two. Also, it only happens the first time each turn you are dealt two or more damage instead of any time you are dealt two or more damage. Let's move on to our next one, which is going to be Crumbling Time. Crumbling time, there is no change. Also, the last one, Corrosive Ideal, also has absolutely no change to it as well. These have all remained exactly the same. Moving into our assemblage discipline, there is something I want to talk about before we actually discuss the cards, and that is that summoning has changed. We're not going to see much about summoning in the level 1 cards. They come up in the level 2 cards, but this is a big change. Summoning no longer gives summoning tokens that you use to summon S loyal espers. When you use the summon ability, you get to choose a loyal esper of a level equal to or lower than the highest level assemblage discipline. Place it within Sphere of Influence. Its initiative card gets placed right as if it were spawned. Spawning has also changed. Spawning now states that when you place a, when something comes out, whether it's a summon or another monster that is spawned, it is going to be placed right after the person, the person that is active at the time. Once this loyal esper hits the board, you're able to gain these summon tokens, which no longer summon the monster, the loyal espers. They're used to discard to allow the loyal esper on the come on the adventurer's turn to gain the ability to gain the ability to give them an ability or make an action, lots of ability of words there, to activate. So you're able to use these tokens to activate those espers along with their normal activation as well. The other things that the loyal espers are able to do is they're going to persist between encounters. You no longer have to keep summoning them. They are, unlike other combatants there, your command combatants, they are not going to heal between encounters. They are able to gain items, but when they do, they go to the adventure that summoned the uh, loyal esper. 
You may never have more than one summon on the board unless, of course, there is a rule that is allowing that to happen. If there is ever a time when you can't have more than one on the board and it's illegal to have them there, you have to choose which one you want. Also, if the Loyal Esper Summoner is defeated, the Lo Loyal Esper will remain on the board and continue to use the Summoner's stats until they're defeated themselves. Other than these exceptions, they're following the exact same rules that we are as well. So I just want to go quickly over the summoning because, of course, this token is now found in your upgrade pack and you're going to be replacing this from the ones you have in your original 1.0 because those are obsolete now. Espers, summoning loyal espers has completely changed. We're going to move into our level 1 disciplines now, starting with Sanctuary, which, guess what? No change. Sanctuary has remained exactly the same. Next, we have Perfect Love. Perfect Love also has not changed. We're going to move into Last Laugh. This is the first one that actually has a change. Last Laugh has gained a exhaust power. When you or a Loyal Esper is dealt damage by an opponent, you may deal the source of that damage to a reducible damage. That's now an exhaust power. You can only use once, well, technically once per turn, unless you can find a way to unexhaust your card. Also, the passive, if you are a Loyal Esper, is defeated. The figure that dealt the damage is dealt their two Conviction Dice worth of magic damage. This has changed from when a, then just straight damage, which is a lot of what you're finding on the original Last Laugh card. Basically, the Last Laugh card has changed quite a bit. So please take a look at it. The difference, of course, is an exhaust power and able to deal damage when you are actually dead. So that's Last Laugh. We'll move into our next one, which is for bode which has seen no change either has our next one familiar familiar has also seen absolutely no change it is exactly the same we're going to move on to our next one which is e euthanasia this one has seen a huge change it's completely changed there's absolutely nothing about it that's the same before e euthanasia used to be able to give you an ability to empower and it gains this ability nope not anymore check this thing out now it's cast spell six it inflicts wilt and de deal six magic damage really six magic damage it seems a little overpowered then if the target was already inflicted with wilt inflict condemn if they were already inflicted with both condemn and wilt Roll a black die, and if a skull is rolled, you are defeating a target. Imagine actually using this on one of those huge giant guys we talked about at the very beginning of the video. Oof, the 50 health. You cast, somebody's able to get Wilt and Condemn on him, and then you cast this and roll the skull. Gone. Wow, this spell seems absolutely bonkers. I might be trying it out. We'll see how it goes. Last of all, we have Banished Knowledge. There is no change on Banished Knowledge. Let's move into the next set. Moving into our subterfuge discipline, we're going to start by showing this precise strike is no longer around. We're going to discard that card. That card is no longer found in this. And we have gained Murder Circus as a level 1 subterfuge. It was a level 3. It has moved to level 1. It has gained pretty much the same abilities as the level 3, but it is now a level 1 discipline. We're going to move into Kill the Messenger. Kill the Messenger has completely changed as well. This one now, instead of making a range attack at plus 2 physical damage during this attack you gain all this stuff it is now stayed changed to you can exhaust if you have a two-handed weapon equipped when you make an attack roll the when you roll if you roll the lowest result on a die you can change a single die to the highest result now of course that doesn't have to be the die that rolled the lowest if you want to change something else you totally can i don't know why you would but you totally can so kill the messenger is a completely new card might be kind of cool to try that one out next we have speed injustice the difference here is we lose the ability to gain plus one even unless we roll the skull two, you are now allowed to re-roll the dodge roll when you exhaust the card. Moving into quick blow, we see no change to this card. Next card we have is follow through. Follow through again has no change. We'll move on to trick shot. Trick shot has some changes here. The change is found inside the exhaust power, which makes sense because it's about the only thing left on the card. Basically, the top part remains the same. But when before you make the roll, I'm allowed to choose to gain negative one attack roll and plus three physical damage. Before it was make an attack with plus roll to the hit and negative two physical damage. So it's changed by the fact that you can do like kind of a, you can, I guess you can say roll the dice. If you think you're going to hit, you can gain the negative one to the attack, but gain plus three physical damage. It sounds really cool. It might be another one to give a shot to. We're considering it's called trick shot. I don't see why I wouldn't give it a shot. <laughs> Next we have like. The Shadows, this card has seen no change. We'll go on to Murder Circus, which is going to be our level 3 and level 2 disciplines. I didn't realize I put them all on the same page. We're not going to go through these. Again, like I said, Murder Circus has changed to a level 1 as opposed to a level 3. Those are our subterfuge. Let's move to our next ones.
We'll move into the Sanctus Discipline. Not a lot has changed in Sanctus. I'm a fan of Sanctus. I like this one. Mend has not changed. It is completely the same as what it was before. Next, we have Magic Armor, which has seen no change. We're going to move to Intervention, or sorry, in Living Bulwark. Living Bulwark is no longer in the Sanctus Discipline. I believe they moved this over to the Martial Discipline. I could be wrong. We'll see that maybe in the Martial Discipline. We have Intervention. This one has not changed. We're going to move to Guardian Angel, who has also not seen a change. I know I'm just keep saying no change, no change, no change, but if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Next we have Courageous Stifle. This one has seen a change. What has changed is it is now plus one more to play instead of the plus, or instead of just one stamina point, it now costs two. The spell has completely changed. It still it casts spell six, but it's going to deal magic damage equal to two times your total armor value, which is awesome. This might be a one I think about I might want to try out. It gains a passive power here, a single combat die of your choice that is printed on an equipped shield or blunt weapon is considered a spell casting as a spell casting upgrade. So instead of using the one you've got, you get to use your weapon. It's really cool. It totally reminds me of playing like a paladin type character or a uh, dark knight type character where I'm able to do this damage using armor. It's more like a dark knight, I guess. Then uh, it's oh, super cool. That's that's courage, courage stifle. It's changed quite a bit. This. It, it's still technically similar to what it was doing before, but it has really seen a big change. We're going to move into Aspects, which is now negative one movement. Instead of two, you get one. And that's really it, except for one other change. We now have Nirvana's Mark inside the Sanctus Discipline. I believe this one moved from Marshall over to Sanctus, so that's why this change has, is here. Moving to our martial disciplines, we're going to see a lot of these either have no changes or quite a bit of change. First off, like we've said before, Nirvana's Mark is no longer in the martial discipline. It is now found in Sanctus. And we have gained Living Bulwark, which has changed any time. Gain resistance physical damage until the end of your next turn. In addition, you may counter for free until the end of your next turn. Then, so the ability now is now found inside the martial discipline. That's pretty awesome. We do have Hammer Helm next, which has seen no change. <laughs> It's still really good for Remy. Next, we have Fortuitous Homicide, which has also seen no change. It's just a quick counter, so there's really nothing to change on that card. Critical Defense has seen a change. The passive has changed a little bit. You gain a token at the start of every encounter. You're going to start, you're going to gain a dodge token. Um, then you're also going to be able to, your attacks gain follow up, gain a dodge token. That's how you're gaining these dodge tokens. It's the same follow up that's over here, but do realize that at the start of every encounter, you gain one dodge token. You start out being able to dodge, which is kind of cool. It loses this whole part down here. That states when you are the target of an attack, these tokens will be spent to dodge, and venture may not exceed three dodge tokens. There isn't a maximum anymore. You could just keep collecting these if you want. Critical defense. Next, we have change the command. This one has also gone a big change. It is now an exhaust power, and it is basically cleared up some of the cards. It says when making an attack, this attack gains, and it gives these things. Instead of attacking at reach two, it just automatically gives you reach two. The follow-up is still pretty similar to what it was before, except that they have now have a new tag called Command instead of just explaining what this is. So the difference here now, they have three different types of ways of moving characters. They have Push, Pull, and Command. Push obviously pushes them away. Pull brings them towards you. Now, Command is now the one that's going to allow you to move them how you want to move them. So that's why this now is here. Instead of it saying, move the target up to two spaces, it says Command 3. So it has the tag Command, which allows you to move it up to three. That's the Chains of Command, which is pretty sweet. You might want to try that one out. Blade Works. There really isn't a change to Blade Works. It was doing just fine. And the same with Anticipated Attack. It is exactly the same. Very very similar to what it was. It's actually exactly the same as what it was before. But there's not too much to change because it's pretty self-explanatory. I do want to go over the tokens found in the 1.1 update pack. These are going to, of course, change the ones that you originally have. First, we have a north token here. This is just going to be placed down anywhere to show which way is north on the board. We have a bug bomb. A bug bomb was not found in the 1.0 group, so this actually gives us a token now. We have unlit and lit dynamite. That's a new token we have. We have these energy tokens. We've already seen those in action. This is an aggro token. This is a new token that was 
made here. It adds an extra rule to the golden rule section of the monster activation. It says at the end, if they're basically what this token did is it people were finding a way to attack monsters and they weren't able to do any of their reactions whatsoever because none of the AI steps fit what was to be able to make them go and attack person. So this token when on the card gives a final AI step that states while a combatant card has the aggro token, add the following to the bottom. Otherwise, move towards the nearest opponent. This figure may jump up to four spaces during the movement. So that gives monsters the ability to get to some of these characters that are able to attack with them, not being able to attack them. The jump normally is only two spaces maximum for a an enemy so giving them four is a <laughs> gives them a way to get there these summon tokens we've talked about these already these are new we have the immune to paralyze which is going to come and play for the very first token we have down here the original paralyzed token is very similar to this one except at the end it's going to gain immunity paralyzed i think i've stated earlier in the video that paralyzed was absolutely bonkers and if you could just keep paralyzing something then they would never attack and it was out of control so now they have removed these tokens and replaced them with these which give the immunity to paralyze so you can only be paralyzed once per encounter which is what these are used for to show that next we have wilt Wilt has also changed. It used to be when determining damage, roll a black die for each shield rolled, you'd take one irreducible damage. Instead, attacks made against you add to irreducible, irreducible damage and ignore resistances. So Wilt has gained potentially a buff or not buff depending on how well you are at rolling black dice. I'm not good at rolling black dice, so it's kind of a buff for me. Next, Poison has seen a massive change. Poison was absolutely brutal before. Now it has changed to just rolling a purple die of irreducible damage, which again could be a boost or a detriment depending on how good you are at rolling purple dice. Instead, you used to just automatically take half of your remaining hit points. That is brutal if you have a ton of hit points. Instead, now you're just losing, I believe, a maximum of seven. That's poison for us. Lastly, we have Courage. Courage has really only gained this part of it when making attack gain a star, shield, and a book. And then you're discarding it if you miss. Before it was basically you have these to give you plus one physical damage. They remove that to just giving you these. So basically you have to have these abilities on your weapon or card to actually activate these powers. You're not just gaining physical damage with them. And that's the end of the token difference. There's not much less to cover. We're going to cover this really quick and maybe some of the other bigger cards like this. First, we have our Abrex dice, Battle Dice game. Nothing's changed when it comes to the cards except for one thing, and that says draw a different rare weapon. You can't keep drawing the same. The same rare weapon coming up would is not going to happen anymore. You're going to have to draw a different one, and that's the same for any of these that have to do with drawing any of those cards. Next, when it comes to our linked adventures, nothing has really changed. Rook does gain that ignore the first instance of heavy, and you may equip additional consumables. The additional consumables, I believe, was there before, but the heavy is no longer there. This has not changed. This hasn't changed either. It may have cleared up a little bit of the wording, and this has not changed. So the linked adventures have re relatively remained the same except for that addition of the heavy. That is a few of the changes that you are finding inside the 1.1 edition of Madara versus the 1.0. It's a great way now to be able to start playing the game. If you're like me, I played all the way up to the mast, found out they're doing the second Kickstarter, and then I stopped for a while because I wanted to make sure I got all the rest of the material that is the way they decided the game should be played before I continued playing. And now that is the time. The time is nigh. It is a time to get back to Madara. I will be doing more videos from Madara. We are going to start from where we left off after the original set of videos I put out there. If you're interested in seeing my playthrough of the mask, please check it out. I'll put it in the description below, or I might put a link right up here if you're interested in seeing it. It was a lot of fun. I had a great time playing through this. This is still my favorite dungeon crawler I have, if not one of my favorite games of all time. I can't get enough of this game. This game is fantastic. Story, character development, overall mechanics, and pro production quality is out of control. Everything in this game is exactly like I would have always dreamed when it comes to playing a fantastic dungeon crawl or even a fantastic game in general. Succubus Publishing is a fantastic company. They've stuck with their game. They've gone through, listened to the community, and created this masterpiece of an epic game. Whew, super, super fun. Like I said, we're going to be coming back to this game. We're going to be starting after the mass. I'm excited to do that. We're going to pick up right where we left off. I'm going to go ahead and get my items and also the new disciplines we're going to decide to use. If you have any ideas of what I should pick up and what I should use, please leave them in the com comments below. I would love to read through everybody's ideas of how you think I should start the game out. Of course, 
course, we got Rook, Remy, Zeke, and Nightingale. Oh, super fun to come back to these characters. We were able to go through all the cards that you're going to see during the beginning of this game, even up through up to chapter one, I believe, maybe even to chapter two. A lot of the cards you've seen are going to be the ones that you're going to be actually interacting with. So that's the why I decided to make the video the way it is, so you can begin playing. If you're interested in seeing the rule changes, the major rule changes, I discussed a few of them in this video, but if you're interested in seeing all the different rule changes that are majorly impacting the game from 1.0 to 1.1, 1 .1, oh, 1 .1, please check out Succubus Publishing's YouTube page. They have a, a video there that explains it, and I will be putting a link to that in the description below, so please check that out. The ones that we covered here, of course, were summoning the aggro tokens, so those are a few of the ones that I touched on. They're going to be doing more of it. I also, the upgrades I touched on a little bit, but they're going to go through those plus some other ones in depth to be able to understand exactly how this all works. Casting has changed a little bit, not too much, and it's become a little bit less powerful. It was super powerful in the last one. I really like casting Gorshot all the time. It was so good. I haven't made a video like this before. I hope this was informative. I hope this helped you out in some way. If it did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell symbol. Also, please feel free to leave anything in the comments below. Did this help? Did this not help? Is it something you may want to see again in the future? Let me know, and I'll be able to try to hopefully help you out. Thank you so much for watching, and if you're excited to see what our characters might do in Madara, and of course anything else, then I need you to meet me at the table.